Um, hi, I'm Leonard Pottering, and I'm going to take away your home directories now. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm a bit sick, so um, I hope I'm not going to lose my voice in the middle of this talk. But yeah, I'm talking about something uh, that has not been merged into system yet, but hopefully will. And it's about uh, reinventing home directories, as the title says, because, I mean, reinvention is what we do with systemd, right? Um, anyway, um, I think we, I have good reasons for this stuff, um, and I hope to explain why, and uh, I hope to also explain what precisely I have in mind that we do. So, um, what am I talking about? I'm talking really about your home directories, right? Dollar home or tilde, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's uh, that stuff that is paired with an entry in Etsy past WD and uh, yeah, makes up your user um, like record and your user data set, if you so will. Um, like after working with uh, um, Linux and Unix for a long time, I came to see quite a few problems with the approach we so far had. I'm pretty sure every one of you knows how this works, right? Like on Unix with Etsy past WD and and home some directory, right? The, I don't need to repeat how that works, right? Um, I saw a couple of problems with this. Um, first of all, um, the way we currently manage uh, uh, user directories in, in, on Linux is basically it requires a writable Etsy to create a user, right? So, uh, so far, we always have this goal that if a system's configuration is not supposed to sh change, Etsy should be um, read-only should be immutable, ideally, even. Um, and hence, the requirement that if a user is created or removed or modified or whatever, you need a writable Etsy kind of sucks, because a user's existence is not really configuration, at least in my view. Right? So the concept that mixes state, yeah, I, I believe that the user record is, is state, it's not configuration, and the rest in Etsy is generally understood to be configuration this way. So I, there's this semantical, this philosophical problem already that, yeah, Etsy mixes state and configuration, and then this propagates into the problem that Etsy needs to be writable. There's also this problem with Etsy past WD and, and home management um, that user ID assignments on Unix need to be propagated between systems, right? There is like a lot of infrastructure in this world for LDAP databases, how user records are distributed um, among many uh, systems, how NFS has user ID translation demos and whatnot, because yeah, everything is bound to user IDs, like numeric Unix user IDs, like these 32-bit values where zero means root. Um, and the meanings of those in context of Unix network file systems always need to be propagated between systems. And that, uh, to me, it sounds so backward, because it basically means that every system you have only exists within a very specific institution, like organization, because only within that very specific institution and organization you can say that user Leonard has uh, numeric user ID 5555556 or something, right? So, um, yeah, I think the classic model worked as long as you had few systems, right? and created, um, like as soon as people tried to, to um, scale it to more systems, they came up with this massive complexity that is LDAP and things like that, and they end up managing this user ID that nobody actually really cares about, which is just an artifact of the implementation and is nothing something people should really care about. And in a world of today, where we scale to the internet, right, user IDs are complete an artifact of the 1970s, right? Like if I have a Google account or Facebook account or whatever account on the internet, there is no user ID assigned to it because it makes no sense. Nobody wants that, right? Um, I mean, there are reasons why user accounts have usernames. There are reasons why they have passwords. But the reasons for the, them having a numeric user ID on a specific system are a little bit weird. So yeah, I see that as a problem. There's another problem. This model means the way we deploy it right now, no encryption, right? Home is generally not encrypted by anything that is directly related to the user, right? Slash home, like you might have um, full disk encryption, right? You might have uh, encryption of slash home as a whole, right? But um, this is system-wide, if you so will. It's not um, specific to the user, and that's, that's weird. Right, like because uh, right now, um, like at least on my laptop, the way I installed in Fedora like a couple of years ago, I got the full disk encryption. So I boot up, I type in a password that is my password, but also it's not my password because it's actually my laptop's password. Right? Then I authenticate against, 
um, my system, um, that decrypts the, the, the hard disk. Now, this is the password that actually matters, right? Like, and after it booted up, I have to re-authenticate re a second time um, into my actual user account. And that password doesn't really matter that much because at that point, all the data of the, of the home directory is already fully viable to anything on the system that ever wants to see this. So I see there is this really weird discrepancy, like this mismatching encryption that we protect um, like the, the stuff that's actually uh, associated with user account is not what protects your data. It's the other stuff that, that uh, um, protects your data that is system-wide, that if we actually had multiple user systems, like where, where multiple users use the same machine, um, where um, they would have to share that password. And that makes no sense. The only way why we so far got away with this is because most laptops are single-user systems, effectively, even though Unix in concept can support more. Right? So I think this is like, this stems from, um, yeah, nobody wanted to touch the way how Unix user management worked. Um, and so we came to the discrepancy and we got away with it because we effectively have single-user systems. I also see the problem, yeah, Etsy PassWD only knows um, Unix passwords, right? Like passwords as you know them. It doesn't know anything else, right? Everything else, how you might want to authenticate these days, UB keys, whatever else, um, cannot be an Etsy PassWD because it's not extensible, right? So anything more modern, anything, like, if you even want to authenticate with a pattern, right? Like which is what phones do and which you might want to do on your laptop too if you have a touch screen doesn't really fit into that model because, yeah, there's no way how that's available there. It's not extensible. This is actually a massive problem, right? Like, um, Etsy PassWD, this database got des uh, was designed in 1985 or something like this, has not been modified once since then. There has been this extension, like the shadow database, which added, like, five more fields or something like this, but everybody wants to add their own fields. And this is, like... This is like fucking ugly, if you ask me, because they created these sidecar databases, right? These databases that extend the user record, but they're not actually stored in Etsy PassWD in the user database itself, but at some other place. And that other place means something very different regarding where you're looking. So, for example, Etsy Shadow was the first um, uh, uh, sidecar database that was introduced. And it contains information about the actual password used and, and like account uh, um, like uh, validity restrictions, things like that. But then accounts demo is like this GNOME thing. They wanted to add a picture for each user, so they have a sidecar database for that and a couple of other things. Samba has one because they wanted to have a GUID um, like in a Windows context. So they, they created their own one. It's also somewhere in VAR. There's um, SSH, which wanted to have the authentication key, right? Like the authorized keys thing in your home directory, right? Which is part of the user identity. It's, it's, it's how you authenticate. It's like your password in many ways. But no, we can't put it in the password file because it's not extensible. So we put it in the home directory. And then, um, yeah, SSH tries to read from that. And it's highly problematic because, yeah, you have a privileged daemon that goes into the unprivileged uh, user directory and it's dangerous as shit. So then we have PAM limits. Um, which is about resource management, right? Like, people want to be able to set limits on specific users. They want to make sure that some users can have more persons than others. The way they do it is they came up with their own configuration file, which is not even a database, but a configuration file in Etsy security limits.com or something like this. So, yeah, we ended up with this... Uh, yeah, because, simply because it's not extensible, we ended up with a, a distributed thing that you can't even manage centrally. Like, even if you use LDAP, and try to manage this centrally, it usually covers like a fraction of this. Usually the Unix records, maybe the shadow stuff, but then as soon as you go into like sharing pictures like of users with LLAP, that's, yeah, that's strange territory. Um, yeah, this is kind of the same thing. There's no resource management doable with Etsy, Etsy past WD. And I think resource management matters a lot, right? Like because not all users are equal. Um, uh, so you want to be able to assign specific resources, memory, disk space, whatever else to users. And yeah, as you passed over, you can't explain this. And then they create another um, secondary database for this, which is a quota database on disk. But yeah, so resource management is as soon as you think about multiple users, you also want to think about the differences between multiple users and uh, how many resources you assign to each. But we can't really do this with Etsy PassW except through this mess of uh, sidecar databases. So this is, yeah, so far, like a number of the problems. They think there are a lot more. This is kind of the, the problems that I saw that I wanted to fix with what I'm talking about here. So 
and talk a little bit about the focus of what I'm suggesting here. First of all, it's only about human users, right? I don't care about system users in this context, right? Like system users being the stuff that demons run under. This is about human users like me and you, right? That the stuff that you have on a laptop. It's not the stuff that you have on a server so much. Um, the goals that I want to be able um, to deliver with what I'm talking about here is, first of all, migratable home directories, right? Migratable home directories means that you can take a home directory as one unit from this laptop to your new laptop or to your third laptop, and it will always work and be self-consistent in itself and uh, comprehensive um, and hence migratable, right? Like, so this basically means that as little as necessary should leak into the system surrounding it, and particularly when it comes to configuration, which is very different from what was there before, right? Like before, um, home directories user accounts were not migratable, right? Like because, as mentioned, we have all these sidecar databases, and there's no way you can sensibly migrate all that metadata that is distributed in all these configuration files in Etsy and all the weird sidecar databases in VAR and whatnot um, from one system to another. I want to go to this way where home directories are, yeah, somebody didn't turn off his phone. I wanted to go, uh, I want this to go to the way where they're truly migratable, right? Like all the way to the point where you have a USB stick like this one and that this can be a home directory and you plug it into my laptop and that can work there and I can take it out and put it into another laptop and work there. But that this USB stick actually is my user account, that it is my home directory and it's truly and natively migratable without any magic bullshit of propagating configuration into the system, right? So it's about isolation, it's about um, uh, unification, everything into the home directory itself, um, and cleaning this up. I already mentioned this a bit, um, it's about self-contained home directories, right? So right now, as mentioned, if you want to have a user account, you have files everywhere. You have files in Etsy PassWD, in Entry, you have an entry in Etsy Shadow, you have probably also have an entry in Etsy Group, and Etsy G Shadow, you have uh, the home directory itself, you have all the side sidecar databases. Um, the goal with this is, yeah, self-contained home directories. That the, everything that is on the stick comprehensively describes the, the, the home directory. By the way, I'm putting this stick here always in your face, but it's, it's not supposed to be just about the stick, right? Like, um, the fact that uh, we can have home directories on a stick is kind of a nice side effect of what I'm doing, um, but uh, my main focus is actually not that. I want, most people probably want to have the home directory on the laptop. I know this, and that's what I want myself. Um, I just want to make the point that it should be that migratable that you can have it on a stick, and it kind of makes sense. So, um, yeah, self-contained home directories, right? The metadata about the user should not be distributed across the system with all its information about the user itself, with all the resource management and stuff. It should be part of the home directory itself. Um, this then means that the mere existence of the home directory's um, file where everything's stored should synthesize the user account in full, right? It should make sure that um, if you call get pw, uh, NAM or something like this, like the classic Unix uh, APIs to, to query user, um, so the mere existence of the user um, uh, file store should synthesize everything else, right? In a way, you could say, I want that, uh, yeah, you know, Unix, everything's a file, that, yeah, users should be a file too, right? Like where you just have one concept in the, in the uh, uh, file system and that everything else um, comes from there during runtime and is not propagated um, persistently anywhere else. Um, one of the goals that I also have is UID assignments should be a local artifact, right? I want that if I stick this USB stick into this laptop, that I might get a UID. And if I stick it to another one, and that UID is already used by another account there, they get a different one and shouldn't matter, right? This is a hard problem. We have to cut some corners to implement this, but yeah, I want that it is a local artifact. It's, a, it's like when this home directory is bound to this specific laptop, it gets a user ID assigned, and then that's um, how it is. But if, I, if it's bound to a different laptop as well, it might get a different one there, so that the propagation of the actual UID numeric value is not necessary, and all this infrastructure having centralized databases like LDAP and stuff to stabilize this are not necessary. Um, I also want that the unifi uh, uh, unification of the user password and encryption key, right? This is what I already mentioned earlier. So far, we had the 
encrypted password and NC shadow, right? Like this Unix password string, dollar six dollar something. Um, and we have usually the hard disk encryption, like the Lux password. I don't want this to be two different things. I want this just to be the same thing, right? Like if you're capable of decrypting a home directory, that's good enough as authentication that you're also allowed to. And also the reverse should be true, right? That if you're allowed to log in, only then there should be any chance for you to um, access the home directory. So yeah, I want these two concepts to just be merged and be the same thing. Also, and this is really important, we should have like in uh, 2019, extensible user records, right? Like so that people can put in these user records whatever they want, right? And uh, we propagate that um, uh, through our APIs to whoever wants to know this. Um, and yeah, so that we are not stuck to struct pass WD, right? This five field structure defined in 1985 or something. Um, but people can stick in there whatever they want. Like if they have some weird requirement for their own company, they can put something there. And um, if other people have different requirements, they can put something else there. But we uh, agree on a common basic vocabulary, but are highly extensible. Also, one of my uh, really important goal actually is to lock locks on system suspend. So um, nowadays, I'm pretty sure that, first of all, most of you probably use hard disk encryption on your, the laptop. And second of all, I think most of you probably don't even turn off the computers anymore at all, right? Like, usually you just lo uh, close the, scre uh, the, the, the screen and um, that suspends uh, uh, the system. And then when you come back, you just authenticate again. That is systematically, I, I mean, it kind of defeats the decryption, uh, like the encryption that you have there, because it basically m the way it's currently implemented, you use hard disk, uh, like full disk encryption. So, um, while the system is up, suspended or running, yeah, up in that, that context, um, uh, the, the decryption key is in memory, right? So if I go through customs um, to a country that I don't trust and I have this, uh, the laptop with me and it's suspended and they pick up the laptop, in that memory, you'll find the decryption key from a hard disk and that's something I, I think we should not do, right? We should, and this is something that, that people might not find important, but I think it's actually one of the most important things in this entire approach at all, um, is, yeah, when you suspend the system, the, the decryption keys need to be removed from memory, right? So that I know for sure that if somebody steals my laptop in suspended state, because that is the most common state that they will probably steal my laptop in, um, they should not be capable of getting any access to my hard disks, right? Again, this is something you really, really should care about because it basically so far defeated all kind of encryption that you had because, yeah, as long as you did system suspend and everybody of you do, does that, if somebody steals your laptop, they can get, extract everything they want. So doing this is actually mu uh, much harder than it sounds at first. Like, because we, the reason why we're not doing this on, on general systems right now is because, yeah, if you use full disk encryption, then the operating system itself is encrypted, right? So if you come back, like if you actually flush out the, the cryptographic keys when you go down for suspend and then you need to require them from the suspend, who's going to ask the question if it can't even be loaded into memory because it itself resides on that encrypted petition that you want the password for, right? So there's a bit of a chicken egg problem and nobody solved this so far. With this, I want to solve this, right? So that when I suspend my machine, um, the operating self, uh, system itself is independent of the individual home directory so that we can suspend the home directories independently of the system itself and hence solve the problem. Also, um, I kind of indicated this already, I think we need to move to more modern ways of authenticating yourself um, to the system. Passwords, great, but also uh, maybe we should do something better. So, um, yeah, one thing I want to be able to deliver from day one of this uh, system, the home thing, is YubiKey support, right? I mean, YubiKey, I put in the sense of, like, how you would use the word Google for search engine, right? It's not just about YubiKeys, it's about anything that is like an like authentication token that Im implements PKCS11, right? And I think we should do it properly, meaning that um, we actually use the cryptographic properties that a YubiKey provides, um, and hence, yeah, we, if, you, if you don't have the YubiKey, that there's no way in the world the cryptographic key for unlocking your account and for accessing the encrypted data on disk can even be um, retrieved. So that's the goal, uh, goals that I have. There's some complications with all of this. Um, SSH logins, right? I mentioned that I wanted 
that user authentication and decryption of the hard disk is the same thing, right? This is inherently incompatible with how SSH traditionally works, right? Like, because as mentioned, if you authenticate via SSH, it goes via um, uh, yeah, the authorized keys file in the home directory. So if you want to authenticate something that is inside of the home directory so that you can access the home directory, where does the decryption key come from to access the home directory, right? You follow what I mean? It's, there's a chicken neck problem. You're reading out the key that allows you access from the encrypted thing, which you only can after you authenticate it, right? So um, my answer to that is uh, we don't allow SSH logins as long as you have not logged in first locally. Because, I mean, allowing SSH logins the way they're traditionally um, done means that inherently the home directory of the user needs to be accessible before um, the user logs in. And I think that's, a, that's something I really don't want to, be, to have. Right? I really want that when I'm logged out here, that not me, but not also anything else in the system can even access my home directory, and that includes OpenSSH to read the, the keys from there. So, yeah, my answer to this is SSH logins into systems that use this can only be done after I logged in locally, which decrypts the hard disk, makes it accessible, and then SSH can access and everything's fine. Um, also, by the way, um, actually the, the authorized keys file is something I, I think it, and we are, I already implemented even, um, should be part of the, of the user record, like this extensible user record, so that you can actually, yeah, it's just there. And yeah, this already actually works. Disk space assignments are a bit of a problem, right? Um, uh, we probably should come back to this one um, later a little bit um, when I talked about how the storage of what I'm doing is actually done. Um, another problem is UID assignments. I kind of already indicated that. So the problem is if we want the UID to be specifically local to the system, right, it might happen because the range of user ID is very small, like it's just 32 bit. Um, that there will be collisions, right? Like that um, if I have my home directory on this laptop and then take out the USB stick, put in another laptop, that somebody else might have already used the UID um, that I used here. Um, yeah, this, this is very likely because the space is so small. Um, ideally, the kernel would help us with this, right? Um, because we had something like ShiftFS, so that it doesn't matter what's actually on disk, that as the moment where I log in, I get assigned the UID and then I mount um, uh, virtually um, all the files to the right user ID. We can't do this, so we go for the next best thing, which is churning recursively if we have to, and try to avoid really hard um, uh, uh, having to do this if we can. Thankfully, churning recursively is surprisingly fast, actually, if we actually have to do this. And I'm kind of okay with the behavior of this, because, um, I mean, we tried very hard to make the UID assignment stable. So, for example, we hash it from the username, but that's never going to be enough because the namespace is so small. But uh, this basically means that probably in, in real life, if it's just Leonard and I have like three machines and I take this one out and move between them, um, I will probably never need the choning. But it's there to make this safe. And ideally, and sooner or later, we don't have to do the choning anymore. Um, yeah, looks locking. I already mentioned that that this is uh, kind of complicated, but there's also a couple of other com uh, complications. If we do the looks locking on suspend, right, like where we remove the cryptographic keys from memory as we go um, uh, into suspend mode, we need something that queries for the password again when the machine resumes, because until that happens, the home directories are locked, completely locked, and cannot be accessed because there's no cryptographic key known for them. So we actually need um, uh, cooperation for this from the UI. Like everything else that I'm doing here, I can do without any UI um, involvements. But in this case, we need um, some, some cooperation from the UI, um, specifically meaning that when the system comes back from, from looks, your display manager, like GDM, whatever you use, will have to reauthenticate re the user because, um, I mean, mostly, effectively, they already do this, but they do it the wrong way right now because mostly the way that they do it is that the screen lock that is turned on on suspend actually runs under the user identity of the user itself. This doesn't work if we suspended the home directory of the user because we can't run code until uh, under the user's own identity until the home directory is um, uh, resumed again. So what we need here is that GDM, for example, is patched that uh, when, it come, when the system comes back from resume, it asks the, the, the password again so that we can unlock the home directory and then can switch back to the user's um, uh, uh, login session. 
So I know this is a lot of material so far. Um, let's now actually have a look in the actual stuff I did um, uh, on the actual code um, c concepts. Um, yeah, there are two new concepts. Like one of them is um, I want to go for JSON user records, right? Like everyone knows JSON. JSON is like what the internet people all do. I think uh, we should just start using that for our user records. Uh, yeah, I, the, the reason why JSON is because it's just the most basic thing. It's supposed to be machine readable. It's not supposed to be so much something you write. It's something the computers write for you and, and things like that. Um, and it's also what probably most of the internet-facing user databases probably use anyway um, when they exchange um, information about users across the network. So that's the first thing, JSON user records. It's supposed to be a superset of the NSS. NSS is a name service, which of Glipsy, it's like... Um, the generic term Eclipse uses for struct pass wd and struct group, which for the ones who don't know Unix so much, that's how user records are done by Lipsy since the 1985. Um, these JSON user records are, queryable, are supposed to be queryable via varlink interface. Varlink, for those who don't know, um, is, a, is a very simple IPC system. It uh, just uses JSON, and it's supposed to be the most trivial um, IPC in the world, so that as long as you have your own JSON parser, you don't actually need any kind of other code base. Um, I have a slide later why Warlink is the right answer here and not Dbus. Um, there are good reasons for this. So, um, yeah, the idea is also that um, from these JSON user records that are queryable via a Warlink interface, we can convert forth and back between this and the classic ones. In one direction, of course, it's lossy, right? Like because the JSON stuff can have any kind of metadata, while struct pass wd and struct group cannot. How does this specifically look like? This is an example. Um, now, if I had a laser pointer, I actually could show you. I think some of them, this is pretty much self explanatory, right? Like username, you guessed it, it's a username. Um, there's, yeah, this position is just, yeah, ignore that. But nice level, for example, configures that when this user called Groby logs in, that all his processes get nice level five, right? It's pretty self explanatory. Member of means, uh, yeah, this user is supposed to be member of the group wheel. I think, yeah. Uh, what's interesting here is the binding thing. Uh, binding is supposed to bind a specific user record onto a specific system. The reason why this is a sub object and not part of the main thing is simply because, um, depending on specific systems, resource management is probably going to be different, right? Like if I have a user record um, for Lennart on my desktop, my super beefy desktop, and I want to put a size limit on it, it should be specific to that desktop because it has so much more memory than my laptop might have, right? So um, the binding concept here basically, is you see the hex string, that's actually the Etsy machine ID. It basically just says, yeah, the following properties apply only if this is bound to a specific system. And then, uh, yeah, GID is the GID, UID is the UID. What you see else there is like meta information about how the actual storage is done. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, this is continues. Um, privileged um, is a special section that contains the privilege information. It's basically what Etsy Shadow is. The reason why it's a sub object is um, so that we can strip it if somebody's not supposed to see it. Right? So the idea basically is that all the information that is in Etsy Shadow traditionally, plus all the new stuff that people want to come up with, um, uh, should be in a specific sub-object so that whenever somebody who shouldn't see this information um, wants to see the record, we can automatically remove it. Anyway, I don't want to go too much detail about the structure of these records. There's documentation plenty about this. What's also interesting is you can sign these. We'll talk about this later, why that's interesting. So that was concept A. Extensible JSON user records plus an API, how to query them, kind of replacing get P, PWNT, but also compatible. Concept B is um, I want that home directories are encrypted LUX um, uh, loopback files in um, uh, slash home, right? So that, um, you know, if I have a user called foobar in slash home, traditionally there was slash home slash foobar and was a plain directory. I want that uh, there now is slash home slash foobar dot home, and it's a file, and it's actually a Lux um, a loopback image, and then when the user logs in, what do we do? We set it up via Lux stuff as a loopback file, and then we finally mount it after validating that everything's okay. These extensible um, user records are supposed to be stored inside 
of that image inside of file.identity. There's nothing magic about that. This stuff is supposed to be managed by a tiny diamond, and it's actually not, it's really small because it doesn't do much. Um, that is called systemd.home.d.service. What does that thing do? It's okay, I have not much time left. There's so much more awesome stuff in this, but let's, let me finish this quickly. So, systemd.home.d, what it actually does is it just, so the, the thing that sets up these home directories as you log in, right? And it also provides NSS um, interfaces so that the old APIs all work, right? So that you can do get end on the shell, for example, to get the user database and find then automatically all these um, user records and everything works. Um, this concept B, like this encrypted locks um, stuff, can be used, uh, like it relies on concept A, but concept A you can actually use without it, right? So if you just care about the extensible user records, that's totally fine, and you should, by the way, because like even if you have the LDAP and these more, more classic user databases, you might be, uh, want to be able to uh, hook up, uh, hook into systemd's resource management, because all this new stuff is hooked into systemd's user uh, management. Like for example, there's PAM systemd, um, that has been around for a while, but what it does actually, it takes the JSON record, um, pulls all the resource control that makes sense, like from, from the nice level, as you have already seen, the classic resource limit, but also environment variables and that kind of stuff, um, and sets it for all the purposes that log in. There is also support in systemd login at service, which kind of does the same thing when you log in, but it applies it to the C group stuff, right? Like, so that it applies to the user as a whole, right? So if you are into LDAP and provide these extensive user records, um, just by doing that, you get this integration to get all the fancy resource management you ever dreamt of. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this, I kind of already explained this. Um, yeah, I, I care about encrypted home directories and loopback files. I care about encrypted home directories on block devices like this USB stick, for example, um, so that we have something truly migratable there. Um, while this is what I tell people I'm going for, right, like encrypted lock stuff, actually the systemd homed component does not just support that as a backend, it actually has four more backends, like classic plain directories for compatibility, butter, sub volumes, FS scripts, SIFs, and looks. But again, looks, that backend is the one I want to push toward, people towards, because um, it's the only thing that's actually fully secure, because the, not just the payload of the user, but also the metadata is, is uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, encrypted, and uh, it's fully featured and all these kind of things, and industry standard and stuff like that. I mean, this is, after all, an exercise in not coming up too much new stuff, but just taking what's already there, and that is looks, for example, and just sticking up in a little more um, nicer way. But anyway, my time's over. I'm fully aware that I totally did not finish all the beautiful slides I have there. These slides have been online for a while, but I probably should take some questions at least. Um, uh, yeah, somebody has a question there. Um, uh, can you, re like, there's a mic. Um, uh, thanks. So, okay. um, you, in the user, the JSON structure, there, is, uh, there, is a, there was a list of groups for the user. Uh, so, that needs to be somehow verified by the system, right? It's so, how do you approach that? So, because user can change, like, whatever in whatever groups he is, right? And then it will automatically gain access on whatever systems. So uh, they log in, right? Um, I mean, the explanation is in this thing, in the signature. Um, so basically, the user records are supposed to be um, changeable by only privileged, like the administrator or whoever manages user record. And then you're supposed to sign them. And each system will only accept the user records that are signed by the, by the right people where the key, like where the signature can be verified and the key is known for this, right? And this is actually, it's not an option. Like, and at least if you manage stuff with systemd homed, it will insist that everything is signed. Like, we live in a world where cryptography is everything, right? So, yeah, this stuff will refuse allowing you to log in on a random USB stick. It will only allow you to log in with random USB sticks that have a user record on it that is signed by some key that is recognized by your specific laptop. And you can re recognize as many as you want, right? So um, you can change that file as much as you want, but if you do, you just lock your, yourself out because you can't sign it because you don't know the private key being used. So I will need the privilege, uh, like privileges to change the SSH key I use for login, for example? Yeah, so the question was uh, um, whether you need privileges to change the SSH key um, or for your own user account. Yes, you do. It's the same way as, for, as it always was. Um, for changing a password. That also requires privileges. This, this is hidden from, from you usually by suing uh, Zuit. 
And it's the same way uh, we can hide risk through policy kit. But yes, uh, I mean, there's no way that your code paths that run under your user identity can change, make these changes, and I'm pretty sure that's how it should be. There, if there is desire to allow um, unprivileged users to change some artifacts of the user records, it always needs to go through a privileged um, component that does policy kit, whatever else, um, to allow this. So if I got you correctly, you said before that you need to log in first in your account before being able to do an SSH login to that. Um, let's say I'm a university student and I have an account on the university lab and I'm at home and I want to access my account on the, on the university lab computer, but of course the system was rebooted overnight so I cannot travel 200 kilometers to... Um, how would we handle that use case? Would it be possible, for instance, to store the SSH key as a LUX key and to change open SSH to unlock my home? I mean, folder? that's not. I mean, SSH doesn't deal in passwords, right? Like it, it, it um, gives you a challenge, and you're supposed to respond to that. And if uh, that kind of stuff means that the only way you can do things if the other side you're authenticating against is an active program, right? That's not how LUX works. LUX, you authenticate against a disk image. Right, so this is inherently incompatible. You cannot use like at least I don't. I mean, I don't see how you could use SSH authentication to decrypt a home directory that is semantically incompatible. Um, so my answer to this is, if you really want um, that this system can come up um, on its own and decrypt your data, don't use this stuff. This is about security. This is not about um, uh, giving up any kind of access to your data. This is about supposed to protect the system. Uh, to protect your data from the system um, as much as possible, um, so that when you're not locked in, it's really cut off, and like mathematically cut off. Um, and regarding to SSH, um, what about having like SSHFS reverse as your so that your local home folder you already decrypted and opened is used over there, and then the credentials inside of that is somehow um, unlocking over there the home. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean it, it, this, of course, always works, right? Like, I mean, yeah. If you, you so, um, uh, you know, for the YubiKey support, right? Like, I, I'm not sure if you know YubiKey stuff. Um, like, there's this general accepted API for accessing uh, security tokens. It's called PKCS11, and there is a project inside of Red Hat, and it's actually, I think, including Fedora and everything, where which allows you to. Um, uh, 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 propagate PKCS11 devices across the network through SSH, for example, right? And with that kind of stuff, you can make all the, the security, like the encryption keys and all that stuff that is available locally, also viable on a remote system to, to do that kind of propagation. Um, I was interested in this because I wanted to make it possible, like I have a YubiKey in this device and I would ideally um, would like to just use that to authenticate through SSH um, onto another system that runs systemd HomeD and um, so that, yeah, the crypto key is sanely encrypted with that. So there are certainly things possible there, right, through this PKCS11 forwarding. Uh, I'm not sure how realistic that is in the, in the short term, but um, I'm kind of, yeah, well, let's see how that works. But again, I mean, uh, the other way, right, that we were just talking about, like logging over SSH into my laptop, I'm not sure, so sure that's that much of a common case because my laptop is a client, it's not a server, right? Like, you usually log from it into other systems, you usually don't log so much into your laptop from, from, from the outside. It's like, philosophically, yeah. Sorry, having? Oh, on the other system. I mean, sure, yeah, I mean, there, there's the solutions. Like, I mean, one thing that is actually kind of nice is like, you could even share these LUX files via NBD. Um, and then if they show up on other systems and then they, if you can log in there and it will just work because, yeah, a USB stick is not very different from, from NBD or something like that. But that's out of focus for everything. I mean, my main focus really, I want my own laptop to be finally secure that I can suspend about this. I mean, this is kind of like the... Uh, this is a summary after all, right? I want these problems to be solved, finally, because we never could solve them. And I want to solve from my own machine because I, I care about the security and these kind of things, right? Uh, so uh, if you remove the LUX encryption key on suspend, does that mean that you have to log out? So are all processes terminated? No. And then a follow-up question, if the processes are not terminated, there might still be some private data in the memory in running applications, right? Sure. Okay. 
Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's data and there's data. There's crypto keys and there's your private data. Yes, if, uh, uh, like, I mean, if I would, uh, if I steal your laptop and try to extract the memory, the first thing I'm looking for is having the crypto keys. That's the one we definitely should kick out. Um, People are using crypto swap and these kind of things. I don't know, maybe we sh there's something more to solve there so that as much as possible the kernel flushes out all the memory onto disk into swap or something and then it's encrypted and stuff like that. But that's outside of my area of expertise and what I can solve. I just want to solve like the really obvious stuff. Um, yeah. But anyway, when the system goes down, we will suspend the Lux device, and that does that basically means that any process accessing it at the time will hang while it does that um, until we resume it again. This, is, this sounds ugly and is ugly, but also it's not much of a problem because we go down anyway into system suspend. There's not going to be any process that might hang because the system, the CPU, held it anyway. So yeah. Um, so if I want to have um, my home directory migratable, but also as a backup, let's say I, I back this up to a separate disk, then I also need to back up the signing key of the signature fi identity file, right? The key that was used to sign there so I can so log back into that system if I ever have to restore it. I mean, this stuff, right, like, it, it doesn't, like, ultimately it's just a Lux file system, right? Like, you can use the classic Lux, like, crypt setup to, to look into this and, and, and do whatever you want, right? And Lux, of course, has no understanding of user records or signed, signed user records, right? Like, for a backup, it really doesn't matter that you retain the original signing key there. The signing key controls who can log in. It does not control who can access the data if he knows the password, right? So for backup, um, uh, it's totally sufficient to just take that one file and and back that up. By the way, it's I mean th this is something people should never forget, right? Like because this says that the user record and the home directory all become one file. You can just take that file from one laptop to another laptop, and you don't need to do anything at all anymore. It just pops up there and it's there. And for the backup case, I think it would even make a ton of sense that if the backing file system of slash home is something like XFS or Butterfest or something, you can do a raffling copy every day or something of that one file, and there you go, you have a perfect time machine um, kind of stuff. I, I mean, this opens up really nice um, uh, possibilities um, as soon as we unified everything into one file, because, yeah, in Unix, most things are focused on one file. Anyway, I think my time's mostly over, but maybe... One more question there. Okay. Uh, how do you plan to deal with uh, different distributions and versions of distributions? Because we have uh, different uh, versions of software, and even if you use <coughs> uh, common com uh, home directory, you will. It would be not working. Well, configuration. So, uh, I mean, systemd home is a part of uh, systemd, that's kind of the goal, right? Like, and unless people patch around this heavily in the distributions, hopefully it's kind of going to be the same uh, thing in all the distributions. All this stuff that I'm explaining here is not supposed to replace or modify the existing users that you might have, right? This is an add-on, right? So that if you have a home directory like this, great. It will show up in your user database and everything's great. And because it's in this version, it's going to be compatible. But... Um, if you're talking about the software that is inside the home directory, people kind of solved this because NFS shared home directories always work like this already, right? And it's a mess and I don't care so much. Um, it's a problem I'm not going to solve for you, right? I'm not going to uh, make sure that every version of Emacs packaged by any version of any distribution can read the same configuration files. That's something other people have to solve. But I at least want to make it possible that the home directories are truly migratable. And yeah, how migratable then they are between the distributions, that's not my problem to solve. I just, the lower levels, they will be perfectly migratable because, I mean, Lux, if I compile, a, if I format a Lux volume on Fedora and then run it on SUSE, it just works. They, they did not break compatibility. And since this is really just Lux, um, yeah. Any very last question or are we done? If, if you.